Hello everyone. Thank you all for coming to my channel. My name is Ariana Marche. If you're new here, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. And if you're back again, what's up girl? We are back with another book review today. And this is Dear Sonali by Judge Lynn Toller. She stated that she wrote the book because she hoped to have a daughter after she got married that would have the type of relationship that her and her mom had, but she ended up with six sons instead. So this was basically a book of life lessons and stories that she would have shared with a daughter who she would name Sonali after her good friend if she had one. I'm gonna go ahead and go into some of my personal favorite lessons from the book. And starting with number one, she has what she calls developing your second set of eyes. And that's basically how much it is that you are paying attention to yourself, how much you know yourself, and are you still learning yourself day by day. So she talks about writing things down and journaling and breaking them down into categories. So as far as, you know, education, friends, family, you know, who you're dating and how you show up in each one of those categories and what is usually the outcome of them. So as far as, ed as, far as education, how much has you have you accomplished and what more do you want to accomplish with it? And are you still training your mind daily? Are you still learning things? Are you still able to be taught? As far as, you know, friends and family, how do you feel about each one of those people because ultimately you know as far as with friends you know they can be a mirror of who you are on the inside and family the same thing because I mean obviously things can get passed down but whether it's good or bad what can they also teach you about yourself and as far as relationships like again you know those are things that what are, what is in you you can attract that back to you and if you're dating someone how does it usually turn out like how is it ending what are you doing in those relationships what are the other people doing in the relationships and do you like those things or not so she kind of just talks about developing your second set of eyes and being able to keep track of your time and your life and ultimately who it is you're giving your time to and vice versa. My second favorite lesson from the book that she goes on to teach was about strengths and weaknesses. And she goes on to state that most people are more talented than they realize, but what if your talents aren't Mariah Carey clear or a rod apparent. It doesn't mean that you don't have them. It just means that you need to look in other places. And she goes to state, don't overlook the value of being an artist of everyday needs. She said that she saw a tweet from some idiot that said, if you don't have a brand, all you have is a job. And I agree that tweet was kind of crazy because living in 2024 and like the age of social media, everybody feels like that your talent or your gift or what you're good at has to be like some grand, you know, something so extreme and grand that you can make money off of or put into social media or the marketplace. And that's not everybody's niche and not everybody is, to, is looking to be famous or to, be extra rich and that's the issue with this generation like unless you are some type of insta model or you got a clothing brand or you sell some type of cosmetics or your instagram page looks like the um the top influencers then you're kind of just overlooked and you're a nobody and she, i'm glad that she spoke on that and kind of spoke against that and letting people know that there are things that are everyday needs for people that you might be good at and you can actually take that and turn it into something. That might be your grand talent. Your grand talent don't have to look like everybody else's. And that right there could be your strength. It's just knowing what you're good at and where you fit in in Earth. So she said, don't just post on Instagram, learn to code. 
Don't just get on your computer, learn to troubleshoot it. You can't post your pictures no matter how pretty they are if the system crashes. It's not a male job, it's a geek thing, it's the future. So, I mean, basically what she is saying, like, if you're gonna do something, shoot, be the best at it. And just because you do one thing don't mean that you can't do the other. You can very much have multiple talents. And that's, that's where it get hard for a lot of people because I know that that is me. I have so many talents and sometimes it's like, well, what do I do with each one? But it's, it's always good to have. A lot of people say that if you jack of all trades, then you can master none. But I mean, I disagree. You can have, you know, your favorite one or two that you can master and still be good at all other things. I don't just agree with putting all your eggs into one basket. Like it's okay to cultivate and explore many different talents because that's what you'll ultimately know what you are truly good at and what comes natural to you and what your true passion is. And that's what she also goes to state and never underestimate the value of oddball abilities. Some people have creative minds, ones that wander around the edges of all those boxes that most people live in. If you can see things differently, you can innovate. Take your oddball ideas and stretch them as far as they'll go. People pay for things that make their lives easier. They also pay for new and interesting things. That's just like these phones. Somebody had an idea about this because the um, the landline phones that you would have at the house, like you couldn't really take those with you. There was not much that you could do with those or only being able to use your phone standing right here at a certain spot at your house because it's attached to the wall. Somebody was like, you know what? I, I should create something that I can take and walk around with. And it might have seemed odd at first. Nobody probably even believed in them when they thought of it. I don't know who invented the phones, but even then, some people probably thought that they were crazy and that it would not happen. And here we are, technology that took over. We got iPhones, Samsung, Androids, and all sorts of stuff. So just never underestimate the ability, even if you have an invention that could make lives so much easier. We pay for these things on a daily. Imagine if we didn't have mechanics and people would have to get up and do these things themselves. Baby, I'm a girl. I'm just a girl. I don't know how to fix no car. I know what certain things is, what they sound like, and you know, where to go and what to do about it, but Thank God somebody thought to create a mechanic shop or something like that. So again, people will pay for things that will make their lives easier. So your talent may be to help somebody else's life become easier. Shoot, people pay for therapy. Some people are not good at taking on their day-to-day -day life challenges. So paying for therapy helps them get through it because they may not be able to see where they're going wrong or how things could change or get better and just navigating through that. But people pay just to go and talk to somebody else, help them with their life. You may just be that good at something as simple as that. Just like for me right now, these videos, helping people and doing these book clubs and letting little black girls know that it's okay to be kind of dorky and get up and read and still be cute at the same time that is okay because this is something that can make somebody else's life easier. Now on your weaknesses, she says, Dear Sonali, she always starts with Dear Sonali. I haven't been saying it, but she said, Dear Sonali, we all do stupid things. The trick is to keep your stupid to a minimum. The best way to do that is to know where you're weak because that's where stupid usually starts. And I definitely agree. And I think that ties in to where she was saying about you having developing your second set of eyes, because if you know who you are and things about yourself, again, it's easier to navigate. It's easier to pay attention to. It's easy for you to be able to call yourself out on things, because if you don't know and you're kind of just roaming, it's easy for you to find yourself in stupid situations or find yourself somewhere making stupid decisions and nothing really good comes out of being at the wrong places at the wrong times. It's easy to look up and find yourself there. And when she talked about your weaknesses in the book, she taught it from a place of, okay, identifying it and how could you develop those areas and make them better if you can. 
So she goes on to say, figure out whatever part you played in things that did not go well in your life or any situations. And you know, how could you make them better? Or if something's not your fault, consider how you could have, oh, I just said that. Consider how you could have made it better again. He also states that people who try to insult you might be doing you a favor. And I've said that before in one of my other videos because sometimes people's insults hold some truth to them. Even the ones where they kind of laugh it off and oh, I'm just joking. No, they're not. I just don't believe that people are always joking because for you to say that and you pointed something out about me, you may not be joking. And that don't mean that everything needs to be taken so literal, but pay attention to what it is and you have to be able to decide if it's true or not, or could this be a negative or a positive thing? Because you can't listen to everything everybody say and take that in. And if it is something that is negative and it can be detrimental to your character or how others see you or in some way, form or fashion to your future, then yes, pay attention to that and try to work on it and try to develop. My third favorite lesson from her in the book is where she talks about people's opinions of you and how you should handle them when they come about. And not only others' opinion of you, but your opinion of yourself. She states that if you're going to be an individual, your beliefs cannot be so fragile that you feel threatened if others don't share them. I know it's hard to be the only one traveling north in a crowd that's headed south. You have to fight the flow and that current steady. This one was one of my favorite lessons because I feel like this is something that everyone faces, no matter male, female, black, or white. Like we live in a world that's extremely judgmental and especially in 2024, everybody is so opinionated, but yet at the same time, extremely sensitive and it's hard to allow people to be themselves and it's hard to for people to express themselves just i mean even on a smaller scale you could just say something as simple as i think ihop is better than waffle house and the whole internet is ready to jump on you and counsel you just for your simple little opinion and it's never that deep but people think it is like you still have to know how to be yourself your own individual person regardless of what others opinions may be because you will even find that no matter what people are going to try to find a way to not like you or to have an opinion about you regardless it don't matter what you do and you know results into people pleasing is never the answer because even that that'll make them hate you more because it's less like you know, you look pathetic at this point. Like that's extremely freaking pathetic that you want my approval so bad that you're willing to go to the lowest pits of hell just to get it. Like you're willing to go the lowest of the low. So it's, it's just important that no matter what, you have to be able to stick to your guns. And again, that's why it's important of knowing who you are and what your strengths and weaknesses are. And she also gave you some pointers on how to do that. So I'm just gonna give y'all a few of the pointers. One she stated, which is my favorite of course, uh, was to read. And she said, and I mean books. You can hold the whole world in your hands if you pick up enough books. They allow you to climb into other people's heads. They expose you to diverse ideas. They deliver up history. And once you know enough of that, it's easier to understand what's happening now because you've read about something similar that's happening before and she uh, um she also goes to state stepping away from your community and watch it like you've never seen before and she just goes on to say that whenever you find yourself a part of a crowd stop and step outside of that crowd and ask you know what are you doing here how did you get here and is this something that you truly believe in do you want to keep moving forward with this crowd like where do you see this situation or their beliefs or anything where do you see them ending up at and is that somewhere where you ultimately want to be she says don't be a bucket thinker bucket thinking is convenient and appears to make thinking easier it says things like if you are of this gender this color or this socioeconomic group you have to believe all of the following if you don't you're not really one of us and now 
I have to hate you. Bucket thinking is an easy way out for people who don't have the strength and vision to stand on their own. And this one really stuck with me because as black people, I feel like we are some of the biggest bucket thinkers. Like we can be our own worst enemy. And now don't get me wrong. There, there's other ways and other people's other cultures that are bucket thinking, but I've never been of another culture or anything. I've been black all my life. My mama was black. My grandmama was black. My great grandmama was black. So I can only speak on what I know to be fact. And um, sometimes there's things like if you don't, like one of the, the prime examples is if you don't come from struggle, then you shouldn't be able to speak on certain things. If you didn't get it out the mud, then you're some type of spoiled brat and you're not like us. And it's just, it's so much. And if you don't, you know, talk a certain way, if you don't like certain things or you don't like to act a certain way or like to dress a certain way or like to show up to certain events, like now you're you're singled out. That's also like, um, I saw a YouTube video where a woman was stating that she was in the workspace and they were just talking, asking everybody about their interests. And you know, of course everybody else, you know, they kind of were saying that aside from work, they drink, they party, or they go hang out, or they do, you know, just certain things that wasn't her. So when they asked her, you know, she was kind of just like, you know, well, I don't do these things, but I do do this. And of course, you know, they singled her out like crazy. And again, she became public enemy number one for standing out and being a different individual. And people will always try to tell you or make it seem like, which AKA is then projecting onto you, oh so you think you're better than us and that's never the case just because i look like you or whatever the case may be or we're in the same setting don't mean that i have to agree with you on the same things don't mean that we have to live a certain way and that's okay next she goes on to say divorce how you feel about someone from what they're saying to you we tend to believe people we like and disbelieve those we don't we tend to believe people who speak with an air of, a, of authority and dismiss those who seemed less confident and that is so true i i agree with that because that going through school i feel like people always dismiss the shy and quiet kid they never really care about their ideas because you know they're not up and rowdy like the rest of their uh, the rest of the kids or you look at them and you kind of see that their face is always in the book or they you know they kind of they do their school work get good grades and they stay out of the way so they're easily dismissed dismissed which i think is stupid because those are usually the people that kind of hit it big they're extremely successful and she says history is littered with people who sold lots of really bad ideas because they told the people what they wanted to hear in the right tone of voice and you know they like to say that the loudest in the room is the weakest but the quietest the most silent person is often the strongest and the most confident that's why i feel like for myself because that's my story like people always overlook the underdog because they don't have the name they don't have the platform they don't have the fame or the popularity the notoriety and it's just like since when does all of those things mean that you're somebody which in this world human majority an average of 99 percent of the world are followers that one percent is what you will find that will be the leaders and the right leaders who are not only about what they talk about but the advice that they could give is from a loving place is from a more pure place and it's ultimately going to lead people to become better because i believe that leaders make leaders and she says that there are lots of zealot people who are on a mission to secure your submission and in doing so in their own power and then she used an example of like cult leaders or i don't know if we could say the name because you two be weird but adolf hitler i don't know y'all know youtube be so weird and i'm still trying to get used to this so 
I'm like, mm, we say certain things and they be ready to, you know what I'm saying? Cut your whole channel off and everything. But, um, you know, she just goes on to use those example of people who were loud and wrong. Like they secured everybody submission, but they were loud and wrong. They led people to death and just so many other things. So she was saying, don't fall for it just because you know they have the following because they have the backing and when they talk it sounds good and she said basically what that is called a first hit beware of first hers the first time you hear about something you are more likely to believe it because you have nothing to compare it with and she says never accept things you hear about for the first time is true without checking the source and i feel like that's where a lot of this generation goes on like you just start to give people credit because what they're saying is sound good that's just like all these podcasts that's floating around people just talking 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 running their mouth and they not living this stuff and not only that it's just it's coming from a a crazy place where they just looking to get people in submission and on their bandwagon and she just tells the readers, any young girl, she says she wants you to be a woman who does not have all the answers, but who is always looking. My fourth favorite lesson from the book is what she calls the journey. And that's basically about your long-term goals and what it is that you want to do with your life. And that kind of goes back to the strengths and finding the things that you're good at and she talks about you know just cultivating all of these things and even if more things pop up on the way while you're in the middle of cultivating something else you know taking it or writing it down and when you get a chance to explore that too left nothing untouched because as humans we're very multifaceted and you know we we're gonna fall in love with a million things in this lifetime we're always changing we're always growing we're always learning and we're always exploring something so just to try to stick to one thing is almost like kind of depriving yourself when you have so many talents and they can be getting put to use and so she just goes on to say you know write those things down keep track of it and figure out which ones work the best for you and she gives the readers encouragement to just believe in yourself. She says that just because what others may say about the challenges that you're facing right now may be true, doesn't mean that they can't be overcome. And she says just to fill your time with things that look like where you want your life to be. Also anticipating hurdles because there is no journey that anybody that will embark on that doesn't come with you know little hiccups here and there and a lot of people say not to have a plan b or not to focus on this but i think that's crazy and very unrealistic because in life you never really know what can happen and of course you can't control it because you may plan for you know a certain thing that could go bad and that may not even be the thing it may be something else you know totally different but it's still kind of smart to have that safety net and what you would do in a situation if or what if happens while you're on the pursuit of you know whatever it is that you're on in your life and my last but not least favorite lesson from the book is what she calls what to look for when you're not looking and of course this one is about dating and she says that usually when someone does and says all of the right things it doesn't mean he's your soulmate it just means that he's had a lot of practice and girl let me tell you she's telling the truth for the most part because even then your soulmate you will know because they won't come just so perfect like you're gonna be able to spot the red flags when and usually when you meet your soulmate they won't even come wrapped up the way that you would like so it's it's best to always be weary of, of when somebody come and they just seeing and doing all the right things and they're it's like a thing of it's just too good to be true take it as too good to be true and i think that's the moment where you should open your eyes and be paying attention even more because i think that's where a lot of women slip up they look at it as disney 
so many of us have gotten wrapped up in the Disney stories of dating and how men operate and think and how we as women should operate and think and how a relationship should be and that's just never truly the case so if anything you need to be opening your eyes and things seem too good to be true okay she goes on to talk about beware of the checklist and i never really understood the standpoint from which most women does it from but she says don't get caught looking for a guy who checks off a list of requirements in your head and a lot of women do the oh he needs to be six feet tall making six figures with a six pack and you know all of these sixes that's crazy if you know you know uh which is why y'all always end up with the wrong person but um anyways i just i think that's crazy because your true soulmate may never come look like he may never come looking like what you want him to, or, you know, he may not have everything ready. Like we're humans. Nobody ever is going to come just made ready because we're ever evolving, we're ever changing. So even when you do meet your soulmate, there are going to be things that you would still need to work on that you didn't even think that you had to. Um, you know, he may not be six feet tall, but he may be taller than you. He may not be making six figures, but he may make enough that can afford you and y'all future children a decent lifestyle where you're able to at least drive a decent car. It doesn't have to be luxury. You may be able to at least take two family vacations a year, something nice. You may be able to keep food in your refrigerator and never go hungry and you may never have to worry about your bills not being paid like those are the more important things i think a lot of women come up with these lists and it's all things that only just benefit them like and it's all superficial crazy things nothing that could benefit the children nothing that benefits the family unit as a whole like y'all some women be so worried about what they want in a man and how it can contribute to them and their happiness. But you don't know the first thing about yourself that can contribute to that man and in which ways that you can make him happy. Like social media got y'all heads messed up and anybody that is in a real and loving marriage where the man is not only loving and respecting the woman not cheating on her not beating on her not manipulating her and doing all of this other stuff and where the woman is actually loving the man not worried about the money and if he falls off she will have his back like just anything and if he is the one paying all the bills you're making sure that you're not greeting him at the door nagging doing all of this other stuff when y'all are in a real happy marriage where y'all are both loving together trying to make it work all of that other stuff is out the door baby all of that other stuff is out the door like people are so focused on when it comes to relationship and what ways they could benefit and what ways you have to look up them but rarely do people think about how they could be good to the partner. So I wanna challenge people. Stop worried about what the other person can do for you and focus on what you can do for them and what you can bring to the table for them because ultimately it takes two to tango and both of y'all gonna have to show up and step and do a little bust a move, bust a little one, two here and bust a little one, two there. Y'all both gonna have to. And that's the real reality of it. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. Anyways, she says, if you start off with the list of too many things you simply have to have, you can write off guys before they real, before you realize they have something you didn't know that you needed. And that's what's important that or that you would enjoy. Had you asked me at your age, if I would marry a dude with four kids, I would have laughed at you out of the room. But the guy who gave me what I really needed came with that attached. And she's talking about her husband and ultimately how her mom did not want her to marry the guy that she married because he was divorced already and already had four sons. And I mean, you can't be mad at a mom like what person would want that, you know, for their daughter. But ultimately, they loved each other and they worked well together. It wasn't about, you know his about it wasn't about the parts of his life that you could see and would 
you know, point out, okay, well, this is not something that I would want. This is not something that's on my list. But again, we're humans. Nobody's perfect. We all have a past. We all have, you know, things in our lives that, okay, you know, they happen. You have to push forward. And imagine if we were writing everybody off just because they're mistakes. Now, there are some mistakes that's like, I don't know, you know, unless you're a P3DO or something crazy like that. But other than that, like, chat, um, I think everybody deserves a second, a second shot at, you know, love and life and you know ultimately her husband her soulmate the love of her life was somebody who yes he was divorced and came with four kids but he was good for her and he was good to her and they also went on to have two more sons and they were married for years and years and years before he passed away and i just think that that's beautiful and another thing that women do is overlook the good guys for the bad boys. And she stated that maybe a guy has no game, AKA not knowing how to flirt or talk to women. And which women only say that because they're so used to the way that the bad boys come off to them, how they're so good with their words, how they're so good at flirting, how they can, you know, talk a scarecrow out of the hay that's on you know what i'm saying like they they can do it to you they can talk you out them draws baby <laughs> you know I, I think they only say that about the good guys because they're so used to the game of the bad boys and she just says that maybe he has no game or very little discernible charm it doesn't matter look at who he is and how he treats women pay attention to what he wants out of life um, and she says, bad boys make for great fun, but rarely do they make great partners. And that is very true. But, um, you know, back to the good guy, she, she said, pay attention to what they want out of life. And I agree because when you put the two up next to each other and discern what it is that they want, the good guys usually what females want, but out of the bad boy. You know, they're very family oriented, career and goal oriented. They want to be the sole provider for the women that want that, or they have the six pack. They may not be six feet tall, but they may be taller, you know, than you. So average height about any man in America may be like five, nine, five, ten. You know what I'm saying? If you're not the six feet, you just have to be very discerning on those things because usually the bad guys, they don't got no real plan. Half of them, they just want to rap. They just want to sell dope. They just want to scam. They just they just want to do low life stuff. Like they don't have no real goals. And if they do, their environment is, is what hold them back. Because I can't say that all bad boys are just truly bad. Some people really do turn out to be a product of their environment. But if they was able to change their environment and get away from certain people, which they have to do that on their own, they could and yes sometimes you can get a push from a woman push from family member or go get a mentor yes but you have to really want that and that's what she goes to talk about earlier when she was talking about bucket thinking like the moment that you see like a hood dude that makes it out the hood like so many rappers they make it out and then you know they become successful or do different things they go back because there's listening at what people say oh you don't come to the hood no more you don't do this you don't do that and every time they end up unalived, you know? So you, it, that, that all goes into bucket thinking. A lot of bad boys are very much bucket thinkers. Stay away from the bucket thinkers. I'm about to sum this last part up, but she says, um, you know, you have to pay attention to the men that you're involved with and don't live in a designation that his actions doesn't support. So if he's telling you, you know, oh, I love you, I wanna be married to you, I wanna start a family, but his actions is, oh my gosh, I'm with this woman when I'm not with you, I'm doing this, I'm lying to you, I'm doing everything but starting a family, or I'm creating broken homes here and there and here and there, like, you can't, you can't keep believing the crazy mess that he's telling you. And when you watch them, don't just watch how they are with you, but watch how he is with others, his exes, the people at the restaurant, the men and women in his family, um, his exes, if he has a baby mom, how does he treat her? How does he speak on her? You know, just things like that. And last but not least, she goes on 
to tell the readers, you know, beware of repetitive romantic mistakes. She says you need to debrief your dating history, scan your romantic past for patterns or like who you're attracted to and how do these relationships typically, how do the, how does these relationships typically end? And she said, remember unexamined dating preferences limit your field of vision. So many people don't want to heal after relationships end. They just go and try to find somebody else to fill that time and then wonder why you're always in romantic drama. And she said, if the guys you like, which is your type, always bring you pain, learn to date against your type. And I agree, that was advice that my Nana gave me, rest her soul. Um, she gave me before she passed because baby, I had a type, a type, and they weren't bad boys. Like my type has never been bad boys, but I like football players, like little chunky boys, you know, good job, good car, you know, they obviously, you know, doing well for themselves, And for the most part, I always got my type, but it just came down to who they were internally that would mess it all up because they were not boys that were in drugs or in into any of the crazy stuff, but it was who they was as a person or who they were to me at least that came down to ultimately be the deal breakers. So yes, that brings me to the end of this book review. And I just wanna say like, in my opinion, I love the book. It it was a 10 out of 10. And I feel like for Judge Lynn Taylor, cause when you watch the show, uh, when she's on there, she is very like strict, straightforward, straight to it. You know, very, I'm not gonna say just so hardcore, but she give it to you straight because she does not want you to miss the lesson. But I feel like in this book, she was actually very loving from a motherly standpoint. Like it kind, she kind of reminds me of my god mom in this book. Like she, she teaches and loves without judgment. And even after you make a mistake, it's not a, oh, I told you so, but okay, well, what did you learn from this? And what are you going to do moving forward? And I love that about the book because I was kind of very shocked that this was so loving because I'm thinking she's going to be getting in here telling us, never let a man tell you more than once that he don't want you. Like, you know, y'all be seeing them clips on Instagram and TikTok, like, baby, she be giving it to the people. But in this book, she was very, very, very loving. And I feel like if she would have had a daughter, she would have had exactly what she asked for. And I feel like she would have been a great girl mom because I freaking love this book. It was so sweet. I feel like she really showed a different side of her in here. So in my opinion, the book was a 10 out of 10. I would recommend but all right, you guys, thank y'all for watching and I will see y'all in the next one.